a fresh perspective on revitalizing U.S. manufacturing. I want to start with the end in mind. So we actually asked a lot of experts if U.S. manufacturing was really on course by 2030 to really be now a leading source in the United States and globally, what would that look like? How would I measure that? What would, what would be the fundamental metrics that I'd know we really are on course? And people told me what the answer was, and then I said, I raised the ante. So they said, how many companies would be really globally competitive? And I picked a bigger number. They said, how many people would be employed? And I picked a bigger number. They said, how much would the GDP grow? And I picked a bigger number. And then I went back to them with this bigger number. And I said, is this number practical? And they said, no, absolutely not. And I went, great, got it, because that confirms what you told me earlier. And then I said, but is it impossible? And they said, no, these numbers are not impossible. I said, fabulous. That's the game, because we want to be playing in a realm called transformation, where we want to be playing in a realm where something is bold, but not yet practical. So you're going to hear about bold and not yet practical. So here are four outcomes that we set that are bold and not practical outcomes. <clears throat> 50,000 globally competitive companies, and in the United States today, we actually don't have a measure of that, but ballpark experts would say that we have now around 15,000 really truly globally competitive companies of all sizes. So this would be a three to five times increase in the number of globally competitive companies. Second would be 2.2 million additional middle income jobs in manufacturing, and currently we have 800,000 short. An additional $1 trillion in U.S. goods made in the U.S. <clears throat> and that would just succeed in cutting the gap in half to countries like South Korea, Germany, and Japan, and would, would cut it maybe by a third to China. So that doesn't even close the gap in terms of our percent of manufacturing in the United States relative to the size of our economy. And the third, fourth area was reducing the environmental footprint by 30%. And this, we say, was a future. This is worth striving for. And so now, where are we today? Where we are today can be summed up with, we're an invented here, made there, and imported back economy. And the human cost of that has been huge. I don't need to go into all the details. I can show you graph after graph after graph. But in very practical terms, four and a half million families over the last few decades have lost middle income wages by the manufacturing being outsourced. 70,000 factories have closed. And how many communities have been devastated by those factory closures. We every year continue to transfer, have an imbalance of trade that's now around $1.2 trillion. And what that translates into is we are transferring $1.2 trillion of wealth from U.S. families overseas to China. Human cost has been huge. Yet, we have the foundation and we have the awareness. From a foundation point of view, we have thousands of organizations in the United States, like the MEPs, that are trying to work on the revitalization of manufacturing in the United States. Like all of the people here that are lean practitioners working in manufacturing companies, in aggregate, thousands and thousands of people and organizations. We have thousands of organizations working on workforce reskilling. We have increasing numbers working on the environmental area. We have the government now funding trillions of dollars 
in Build Back Better and other kinds of initiatives. So we've increased the awareness through COVID of the impact on the national defense and the supply chain and you know, consumer goods. So there's nobody now in the United States who's untouched by the fact that we've offshored and diminished our manufacturing capacity. Here's the zinger. The tide's still going out. Year over year over year, the percent of goods sold in the United States, made in the United States, continues to decline. So we can say we're reshoring jobs, that's great, but we're actually importing more from overseas over and above what we're reshoring. So the tide continues to go out. So one of the fundamental questions industry reimagined as research is what's going on that the tide continues to go out in spite of all of the efforts of all of these people, well-intentioned, and all the money that we're throwing at it. So we have a hypothesis that, about why the tide is going out. <clears throat> and after 25 years of US decline, many of you have grown up in a world where manufacturing has only been in decline. That's the world you know. When you grow up in a world and that's all you know, it's inevitable that that's the way it is. So we say that right now, what most do not realize is we're living in a narrative and the narrative is U.S. manufacturing is in inevitable decline. When you ask young people where do they want to work and you give them a list of 10 choices, most of the time manufacturing is 9 or 10 in that list of choices. If you say to executives, where are you looking to locate your facilities, there's a bit of a shift taking place, but we don't really know how sustainable that is. We'll see. So there's this hidden hand of inevitable decline, and inside of that hidden hand, there are many perceptions that are outdated and no longer true, but we keep reporting them as facts. We keep reporting that it doesn't matter where we make things. Well, now that's changing. We keep reporting that manufacturing jobs are dirty, dumb, and dangerous. We keep reporting that they're low-paying jobs. We report that they, manufacturing jobs make 15 or 20 percent more than a Walmart worker. That's just not true. A skilled machinist is making 60 to 80 thousand dollars a year. So we're inside that old narrative, preconceptions continue even though they're no longer true or they're outdated. And so we're creating this new narrative called <clears throat> a world of vibrant opportunity. If you think about what we're doing, like the Hubble telescope and the James Webb telescope, Hubble looked at the visible spectrum and it saw the universe through the visible spectrum. James Webb looks at it through the infrared and you look at the same area of the sky and you see millions of more stars than you saw before. So we're suggesting that a shift in the narrative will bring into view opportunities that you can't see today inside of the old narrative. And I'm not talking about you folks because people in this room tend to be more of the people who see vibrant opportunities. I'm talking about the 350 million people who are not in this room today. So when you look at this world through the lens of vibrant opportunity, you start to see that there are a lot of opportunities that are happening now. They're just not widely scaled. And these opportunities are worth hundreds of millions of dollars and millions of jobs, well-paying jobs. So one opportunity area is in revitalizing the supply chain and that's getting a lot of press. But in order to revitalize the supply chain, our suppliers in the United States have to be more competitive. People are not going to buy if we can't compete with pricing here in the United States. So while there's a lot of forces now that are saying, 
yeah, we'll pay a little bit of a premium for things made in the United States. You, it's just going to be a little bit of a premium. We've got to be able to compete in the global market. The second is we want to manufacture the future here. So the first is about bringing back. This is now let's not give it away. Let's make the future here. Make the electric cars, make the clean tech, make the smart cities, make the advanced manufacturing. We only make about 10% of advanced manufacturing equipment in the United States. We buy 30%. So we're importing tw twice the amount of advanced manufacturing equipment than we make in the United States. These are real bona fide opportunities for companies to participate in an economy where manufacturing is truly vibrant. Then part of this vibrancy is we've really got to adapt to the workforce in the 2020s. It's a different workforce, you know, not just the great resignation and everything, but we've got all the baby boomers retiring. We've got the rise of the new collar worker. We've got the appreciation that it's skills, not education, that we really need to be valuing. So there's a whole adaptation that needs to happen, again, and scaling that. And then there's transforming company competitiveness, lean being front and center to that, and off on the sides are advanced manufacturing technology and industry 4.0. And we all know you don't want to automate something that's already inefficient. You want to first make it efficient. And so lean should be front and center in making sure we get our processes working right. And then let's put industry 4.0 or advanced manufacturing tech to bear. So that is, if you will, that's industry reimagined 2030. We're shifting the mindset from inevitable decline to vibrant opportunity. Foundations are in place, but the future is not assured. And what we are doing is we're creating opportunities for unprecedented collaboration, all right, in order to bring scale to things that are working today but are just not scaled. And so ways that you can participate is get on board, Find it, catch yourself in, your, in that old mindset. When you hear outdated perceptions, don't let them just sit there, all right? Dispel them. Find existing bold opportunities and create unprecedented collaborations. So I want to thank you. That's the opportunity for me to introduce Industry Reimagined 2030.